the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce for having us. Uh, I did say you could do the short introduction, but you got the long one, so I'll dive straight into it. Um, welcome to the Water Bear Network, everybody. Um, my name's Sam, as has been introduced. I'm the head of strategy for the network and have been involved with the team for the last couple of years. Today, over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk you through what is Water Bear and what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do things a little bit differently to the norm in the media industry. Before I start, um, as we're a visual media storytelling and film company and network, I better let the films do the talking. So we've got a short clip to show you before I kick off. There's a world out there, filled with nature. To feed your curiosity. It's magical. People need to see this and expand your mind. The spiritual connectivity is so strong. When we go out into nature, it heals us. If only we choose to really take it in. Get purposeful. And see it. That's my hope. Join Water Bear. We're going to bring you a comforting dose of solutions and sustainability. A place for award-winning filmmakers. It can change your life. To share their adventures from the world. The wilderness is a drug I couldn't live without. Wow, that makes me really excited. It defies belief. Hear unheard voices. The autism helps me visualise what I want to capture. Connect with charities. We can make a change all together. And rewrite the rules. None of this would have happened if people had not done what they've done. Take a little bit of time to educate yourself. You have a voice. Please use it. Once we become aware, then we can act. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome, everybody, to Water Bear. Some people have called us uh, the Netflix for nature, and today I'd hope to show you why we are that in part, but there's actually a lot more to our story. Um, when we launched only six months ago, we had about 3,000 unique press articles written about Water Bear over our launch period, and I'd say 95% of them called us the Netflix for nature. And so we adopted this tagline, and it kind of does what it says on the tin, really, but um, we are a lot more than hopefully the Netflix for nature sums up. Really, what we are is a community um, and a platform. We are trying to become the one-stop shop for this industry, the sustainability circularity movement, uh, where people can come, watch, learn, and become inspired. Our story begins in 2020. Um, obviously, not a very good year for the world, um, but we made it work for us. We built our team, and we launched our app across iOS and Android, uh, and we got cracking. We kind of had a, a, a never-say-die attitude and went out there into the world with this amazing vision. And over the last six months, we've been working very hard to make it come to life. We have a core thesis at Water Bear, and one of, that, one of the lines from that thesis is that the UX of doing good is broken. And what I mean by that is that when people, the average Joes of the world like me, go out into their busy lives and they're struggling to pay the bills or paying rent or just living normal human lives, thinking about things that are bigger or, or requiring more time and effort is often one step too far. The world, the industry is very fragmented. There's a lot of scary news out there. There's a lot of depression. Um, there's a lot of people who maybe put their head in the sand because those problems and ideas are a little bit too difficult to grasp or too big to get in front of. Um, and while we don't confess that we have all the answers, what we try to do as a company is to try and find that secret source of ingredients, that combination of stories, technology, and partnerships that really allow people to come to Water Bear, become inspired, and learn what they can do to contribute to this amazing world that we live in. I can summarize what we do in kind of two main areas. Ooh, is that changing? Sorry, tech issue there. Um, so what do we offer? We offer um, a creative content and storytelling studio, and I'll come back to you later in the talk exactly how we want to tell stories and also where our focus is for this session, the interactive distribution and impact platform. We try to make the problems of the world feel a little bit smaller and more accessible through what we call atomic storytelling. And what I mean by that is summarized in the quote on the screen by our board chair, Tom Tapper. 
Making a documentary that explains the climate crisis is like trying to paint the walls of the Sistine Chapel in 90 minutes. What we're trying to do is take the big ideas, the big inconvenient truth, and drill it down into a small atomic story about one man and, for example, one octopus, like one of the films that we were involved in over the last year. This means that we can take some big problems and condense them down into smaller narratives that allow people to engage more deeply with the characters, the people, and the stories behind these big crises and the organizations that are working pioneeringly on the front line. But we also need a tech solution to actually deliver that to the masses. And we're really trying to build the Water Bear platform, as I say, the one-stop shop for all of these stories. That starts with a big commitment to storytelling. And what we try to do is what we call interactive video streaming, uh, which again is becoming more and more prevalent in the industry. But the ability to actually take action while you watch a documentary has not been cracked yet. And this is our tech mission, is to try and give people the tools there and then while they are watching to actually engage with the content and go deeper and take action in a beautiful user experience. And what we have is a functionality called Water Bear Connect, which you can see on the bottom graphic there, which as you're watching, you can swipe up and engage a toolbar of all the different calls to action that we think are relevant to the film that's playing. This could be donating directly to an NGO, um, and I'll show you some of those in just one second. This could be sharing this news with your friends and community and saying, hey, check out something I did today or something that I love and really building this amazing ability to take action while you watch. And this is the core piece of the tech that we're really, really excited about innovating on over the coming weeks, months and years. The beating heart of Water Bear is an organization group of 98 NGO partners. Now, these are some of the biggest and most well-known NGOs in the world, from Greenpeace to WWF, but also some of the smaller, more grassroots organizations. And really, principally, we have one main offer with these guys. It's to say, where are some of the stories that exist in your world that haven't been told? We try to go and unearth these untold stories and turn them into high-quality films and media. We don't for one second think that we can do this better than some of these NGOs. These guys are really masters of their craft, and they've been on the front line of some of the most amazing and scary crises that the world has ever seen. But what we do think is with our unique three uh, pillars of Water Bear in terms of stories, partnerships, and technology, we can actually bring something to this world that has not been done in a big scalable way just yet. We also work with a group of organizations called our Friends of Water Bear. And these are media partners, these are news platforms, film festivals, again, trying to find all of the major players in our industry and trying to aggregate and amplify the work of these organizations in one place. We have this big belief again at Water Bear that we need to have more narratives that use amazingly cultural, cool, relevant things like sport, like music, like the arts, to try and transmit circularity and sustainability messaging through the stories that we tell. We're on the cusp of a really exciting partnership with a Premier League football club, for example, and we really want to work with them to use football, which is the biggest community on earth, to communicate stories that are really important to us. And all of these guys are really innovating in the space of circularity. Another example is a brand that just recently came to us and said, hey, we're really interested in circularity. How can we communicate this both internally and externally? And we're a perfect partner to actually go out there and say, this is how you do it. These are the stories that you tell, and this is why you should. But at the heart of Water Bear is our content platform. And what we call this is an atomic patchwork of stories. It's not about the big glossy film um, that takes two years to make and millions of dollars. It's about creating this atomic ecosystem of patchwork stories that together amplify and aggregate to build this in, you know, never unprecedented and, and amazing content library that we really love to showcase. So when you do land on Water Bear, you're met with this melting pot of stories and narratives and amazing inspiration and enthusiasm that you can have for our natural world and also some of the wider systems. Um, I'm just going to pause here and play you a little reel.
So alongside the atomic patchwork of short form storytelling, we also have some amazing documentary titles that you can actually rent on the platform through our TVOD service. We're actually one of the only platforms in the world where renting a movie like you would at home with the family actually funds great storytelling. So we have a partnership with an organization called the Resilient Foundation, which is set up to fund high quality educational storytelling. And so just renting a film on the platform of some of the most amazing documentaries of the recent time actually finances content uh, to go back on the platform and create almost like a circular uh, content financing engine. It's a dream and it's building, um, but it's one we're very, very excited about. The backbone of Waterbear is, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals. We had a bit of a hair-raising moment on the day of launch where we had been working on formal sign-off from the UN for about six months to actually get the permission to use the SDG iconography on our platform. And happily so, it came in on the day of launch to say, dear team, you now have formal permission to use the SDG logos. For the average consumer, as we all know in the audience, the SDGs don't really mean much. So we like to say that we're turning the SDGs into values, into stories, and into amazing inspiration. But we do have this vision, although we were tagged with the Netflix for Nature line, we are moving now into different forms of storytelling across much broader SDG subjects. And in fact, the next quarter on the platform is dedicated to the theme of today's event, which is actually circularity. Um, so please do go and look out for some amazing circular content on the platform. Just to summarize um, where we are with the platform, what you can do is watch films on our amazing watch environment, which is a very high quality video on demand experience. You can then connect directly to the front line to actually watch and engage with content and stories from some of our amazing partners and also take action. We like to say act with impact and actually dive into some of the calls to actions, campaigns and initiatives of some of these amazing NGOs. But our vision is not just about NGOs. It's about creating this melting pot of purpose led organizations. Our business model at Waterbear is, again, trying to disrupt the space at the moment and the classic models that exist in media, which, of course, are subscriptions and advertising. We have neither. So we like to say that we're an, an, a free ad free platform and we actually run the platform financially from a integrated brand sponsorship model. So we're looking for amazing purpose led brands to join the network and join our storytelling mission. And we've found several already some of the first movers in our in our network to join us and support our work, which is really very exciting. Those two brands are Nikon and Natura and & Co. And again, a massive thank you to their early belief in our platform. We're really excited about the potential of building forwards with these guys. They open up new audiences. They allow us to break from this sustainable green echo chamber and really engage their consumers, their staff. Natura & Co., for example, with 34,000 employees around the world, has a really exciting potential and storytelling future ahead. Just to summarize where we've got to this year, uh, before we close, um, we've launched in over 50 countries, so you can now access Waterbear around the world. We started planting the Waterbear Forest, funnily enough, up in Scotland, in the Highlands, um, on the road to COP. We've begun our work with the New York Times, and we'll be focused with them uh, around some amazing activations this year, including their digital event series, Netting Zero. Um, and our CEO, executive produced the amazing Oscar and BAFTA winning My Octopus Teacher in partnership with Netflix. And so that was a huge, thrilling ride for our team here at Waterbear and our great sister organization, Off the Fence. In the last few months, we've built a community of 80,000 members, uh, which is really very exciting for us as a new brand. And in terms of our audience, we're seeing some trends that we slightly predicted, but also some new ones emerging in terms of outdoor lovers, fitness enthusiasts, avid news readers, tech heads, and music buffs. We're really trying to, our core mission is to try and break out of this echo chamber that we live in, in terms of the environmental and sometimes circular space. For most people, they don't know what that is. And what we need to do is try and use storytelling, try and use technology, and try and use amazing communications to try and break that echo chamber and bring new people into this space, recruit new audiences. Just a few final facts for you about Waterbear before I close, um, which links again to the theme of the session. We are an Albert certified production studio, so we work towards the BAFTA accreditation for all of our films. We try to produce films that we say are decentralized and decarbonized. That means we're not flying anyone around the world. We're using almost a circular approach to using footage uh, and archive content production, which is obviously cheaper, greener and more cost effective. Um, we are actually now a pending B Corp, which is really exciting for us. So we'll be one of the first video on demand platforms that achieves hopefully the B Corp certification. 
Um, we're also streaming using Akamai as our CDN network, which is obviously one of the most sustainable players in the industry. As I mentioned, our circularity quarter starts in July, which is very exciting, working with our great friends at the Circle Economy, who actually made the link for us today. Uh, and we're also going to be following this impact-led methodology for all of our productions. Without diving down that rabbit hole, what we do is we try and do an impact landscape assessment. So whether the theme is circularity or something else, we really dive deep into how to talk about these issues and then go out there with the stories that we think are going to have the most impact. I'm just waiting for my connector to put back again. There we go. So just to summarize, we have three core pillars at WaterBear, watching, connecting, and taking action. We believe through improving the user experience in disruptive tech and allowing great storytelling to inspire new audiences, we can really achieve a massive impact. We know it is time to act. We know it is time to do more as a global society. And we believe WaterBear, as a free educational one-stop shop for the world, has a really amazing and bright future ahead, driving impact and driving change within this amazing movement that we are all part of. As we like to say at Water Bear, it's time for a new story and it's time to add yours. So if you are interested in finding out more about our platform, please do check it out, uh, waterbear.com, um, and we can, yeah, dive into the Q&A. Thank you very much for listening. Sam, thank you very much for that. That was fantastic. My goodness. Right. Well, I'm going to guess that there's lots of excitement, including in my own brain, about possibilities as a result of hearing all of that. Now, you'll be really happy to know that um, about 68% of our audience here today are already on the circular journey and are actually in the midst of business uh, changes themselves. So you've got a warm audience here and I'm quite sure there'll be an appetite in the room. But before I bring our other panelists in, what I'd like to do is just ask you one question, which is, you know, could you just explain a little bit more about why you think technology is key to enabling a circular economy and addressing the climate crisis? So um, in short, well, actually, let me start from behind. I actually am probably on the other side of the fence to this, not to be controversial, but I believe the reliance on tech cannot be uh, too drastically communicated. And we do need to slightly go back to our roots when it comes to the climate crisis and our future on this planet. And I think learning from uh, the communities that have built the closest and deepest relationships with nature and still hold those deep relationships with nature is hugely important to our future. So it's both about tech innovation, disruption and accessibility and affordability, but also actually going back almost in time and reconnecting with our roots and, and slowing down a little bit in terms of our emotional and spiritual connection with the natural world. That being said, technology has a huge, huge role to play um, in circularity, not only in terms of the business supply chain innovation, but actually in terms of communications. And I'll speak from our standpoint and using the water bear example, we really believe getting the circular message out there to wider audiences is so fundamentally important to our future on the planet. And we need to use tech as a great solution to do that in terms of disruptive distribution networks, in terms of carrying messages, in terms of sustainability. The elephant in the room in streaming is, of course, the energy usage. Um, and we need to disrupt and use amazing tech innovation to actually achieve all of those goals while reducing our, our impact on this planet. So it's a combination of amazing tech innovation, but also going back in time and reconnecting with the natural world. No, and that's a lovely kind of juxtaposition of the two points and something that I think once, uh, once we hear a little bit from our other panelists, I'd like to kind of explore how we bridge that gap, because obviously this is a business community audience that we're speaking to here today, there, although there are some wider stakeholders as well from the city here um, and elsewhere, actually. But how do we get that gap bridged between the business community, their ambitions and progressions on a circular economy uh, and climate mission, and actually some of the, the beautiful photo photography that you've shown us here today, which is the actual impact on the ground for our natural world and our, our actual planet, and bridging that gap and how people tell that story beyond the planting trees argument is going to be really important. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to think uh, think on that, and then we can come back to that right. once I've introduced our other panelists. So um, I'd like to welcome now, um, after that fantastic uh, introductory scene setter from Sam, our next two panelists, Michael Groves, uh, who's the founder of Topolytics. He's a geographer with a PhD in aerial and satellite earth observation. Uh, he's got an experience as an environmental management, sustainable forestry and sustainability reporting. He's the founder of Topolytics, indeed, and he's a data analytics company uh, that specialises in data analytics. 
and it uses mapping and machine learning to make the world's waste visible, verifiable, and valuable. So we'll have to hear a bit more about that shortly. And then our last panelist is Paul Duddy. And Paul is the Managing Director of Hypervine. It's a company building digital applications for the construction sector. He started his career in architecture before moving into the tech world, where he has worked for some of the world's leading startups in 3D printing and pharmaceutical analytics. Paul started Hypervine in 2018 to build an app that provides end-to-end -end accurate site data to give actionable insights that save time, money and scope and also carbon emissions. Now, first of all, what I'd like to do is say a very warm welcome and thank you for joining us today. But I'd like to come to Michael first, if you'd be good enough to just give us a couple of minutes uh, overviewing what Topolytics actually does over and above my brief introduction and the importance that the circular economy plays within your own organisation. Morning. Thank, thank you, Alison. Um, well, I guess we see ourselves as a digital enabler of the circular economy. Um, and, and we've specifically um, made the choice to focus on, if you like, the downstream kind of material system, i.e. the waste system. So that's why, um, you know, we think there's opportunity there to make that system much more visible, um, going back to your description uh, just then, uh, in order to build trust in the data, because at the moment, there is very little kind of visibility uh, and, and trust in what, what people know about how much waste is being generated, whether it be from a company, a business, uh, an organization, uh, a household, a uh, local authority, city, et cetera. And then what happens to that material and also what could happen to that material. So building trust in that data across that kind of global system is what we're about in order that we can unlock the value that's currently being lost, uh, both in terms of the value from the material itself, but also the value that could be gained for those different players in that system. So whether you're a, an organization that is uh, a manufacturer that sort of generates waste, uh, whether you're a company that is doing something with that material, a recycling company, for example, or whether you're a sort of uh, city authority or, or, or government agency that wants to actually have a better understanding of what that system looks like in order to build better policies. So we think that there's a big opportunity globally to, to, to do that because fundamentally, at the moment, more than 60% of the material or the waste material that we generate in our cities and you know, in our sort of urban environments is still going into a landfill or a waste dump or is leaking into the environment. So, so, so the outcomes are not good. So we think there's a kind of huge opportunity to change that. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're basically using a whole range of different analytical techniques, uh, I would say sort of data science, sort of geospatial sort of mapping techniques in order to sort of build that picture and pulling data in from many different sources, whether it be from a simple spreadsheet right through to a, to a sensor. And that way we build up a better version of the truth so that we can make, ultimately make on a global basis, make better commercial, but also environmental and social decisions about what is happening to that material and what could happen to that material. So that's effectively top of it's in a nutshell. And we're based in Edinburgh uh, and we are sort of operating um, in the UK, but obviously operating uh, internationally as well to, to really to meet that mission of making the world's waste visible, verifiable and valuable. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Paul, can I come to you, please? Would you like to give us an overview of Hypervine? Um, what your company actually does in a bit more detail, but also the importance of circular economy and what, how that plays out in your organisation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Hyperfine is a Glasgow-based company. We capture and track all construction site activities to empower developers to build smarter, faster and cleaner. So that's our, our main objective. Um, for Hyperfine specifically, um, there's quite a bit that we're wanting to do in the waste management area. Um, so basically, as, as we track materials that are coming into construction sites, we've actually identified ways of um, stopping waste before it happens, basically, or stopping it before it becomes waste. And we're hoping to do that as we, as that sort of, as the data sort of trickles through, we're actually developing solutions right now that would reduce um, waste before it even enters a construction site. So you're, you're always going to have some form of waste. Um, but what we are looking to do is minimise that through um, our metrics that we capture on construction sites. Um, so basically, you, it's all about capturing as much information as possible. 
So when you've captured that information, then how are you trying to manage stopping it becoming waste? Tell us a little bit more about that process, just to tell, tell us a wee bit more about that just now. Um, well, it's about understanding what's actually being built. So if you know what's being built, um, you know what materials it's need to build that. So what we are looking at is why are people ordering more materials than they need? That that type of thing is that is basically it. Um, over ordering uh, materials when you don't really need that many. So if we can understand that at a much higher uh, sort of detail, then we're able to prevent people from buying more than they need, and so it reduces the amount of waste that actually comes that will, or it reduces the amount of material that comes to the site, and then it will reduce the amount of waste that actually is going out the site at the other end, basically. And uh, so it's basically a detailed understanding of what's actually happened on our construction site and what's actually been built um, and understanding that activity. Great. OK, well, so three very different perspectives here. So I've got a couple of questions to come to you, Sam, following on from your keynote uh, presentation. Actually, some of it's probably slightly unsurprisingly to do with live streaming. So first up, we've got uh, Matt Brown from the Scottish Exhibition Campus, which is actually going to be hosting COP. Uh, later this year, and he's asking about the growing popularity of live streaming, um, particularly, you know, live events. Do you have any plans to integrate live streaming into your platform? And what's the future of live streaming, in your opinion? And then, in addition to that, similarly, in the live streaming theme, uh, Martin Cambridge from SDS uh, Skills Development Scotland is asking, how do you keep it clean, streaming? How are you going to keep it clean in terms of impact on the environment? Two, Two great there. questions. Yeah. Um, Bang on. I think the future for us is very much live um, and we are going to be integrating live streaming uh, this year, hopefully, which is really exciting. Um, our bubbling under the surface of Water Bear is probably a transition from longer format uh, documentary content, moving more into the instantaneous uh, live content uh, news almost so we can actually have uh, input and access for our community into the front line and into some of the stories that are emerging rapidly. Obviously, everything is changing almost daily in our space and we need to have these stories um, at our fingertips. So yes, we're integrating live um, and we'll watch this space because there could be some stuff happening um, later this year up in COP that could be very exciting. So we're really excited about that. Um, in terms of clean streaming, again, I mentioned it briefly in the talk, it's the elephant in the room in some ways. I think the, the overall usage energy-wise from the streaming industry around the world is, is absolutely colossal. Um, we're obviously working with some of the best in the business at Vimeo and Akamai for our CDN networks and everything else and doing our, our absolute best. But it's our dream down the line to, to make sure that certainly our own shop um, is run off 100%. Uh, renewable energy um, but again a lot is down to the end consumer and that's something that's slightly out of our control but we are working with the kind of front runners in the industry to try and keep it clean um, but it is something that the whole industry needs to wake up to and we need to keep innovating uh, to move towards a, a cleaner streaming future um, I hope I answered both your questions. You did certainly indeed thank you very much now Michael um According to Accenture, who we've been working with uh, over the last few years, um, disruptive for um, IR industrial revolution technologies are the biggest enabler to transition to a circular economy. How has disruptive tech enabled Topolytics to develop circular solutions for industry so far? And what do you think is coming? Well, I, I guess we, we couldn't do what we do without the emergence of um, low cost uh, disruptive tech. So if you think about the, you know, the fourth industrial revolution and, and all of the sort of technology that's coming out of there in terms of uh, internet things, uh, kind of sensing, um, some of this sort of AI machine learning um, kind of technology that, you know, that comes out of, you know, people like kind of Google Cloud, etc. So we're harnessing some of that, you know, technology and pulling that in and then using it in order to sort of achieve the, the you know, the goals that we we have set and also to be able to answer some of those questions for you know our customers whether they be the waste producers or the recyclers or, or, or government so 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 i think that it, it it's not only the sort of the technology per se but it's the uh, ability to use and access that technology you know at scale at a cost that makes it possible to then you know sort of provide these kind of kind of um services and generate these insights for uh, for for uh, customers, so I think that's a uh, you know a kind of key point um, in terms of wh where it's going. Well, clearly, you know, if you look at what's happening with with the sort of AI machine learning and 
you know, some of the sort of work that's happening there, look at what's happening with uh, distributed ledger technologies. Uh, then obviously the whole kind of sensing smart labels, you know, that, that, that whole piece as, as well is kind of continuing to evolve. Um, and, and, and then, of course, you, the back end, you've got the ability to sort of manage and process significant quantities of data. Now, that clearly does also generate, as was touched on there, that generates its own impact in terms of data centers, et cetera. Uh, but clearly, there's a lot of work being done there in terms of, you know, kind of using AI to actually uh, address the energy use within those uh, within those environments. And, and I think in all of these things, you know, when you're talking about, if you like, the environment and environmental impact, there's there's always trade offs. You know, so so you know, there's you know, we're never going to find that sort of perfect, beautiful kind of digital solution that doesn't have some form of um, some form of impact in in its own way. So we have to kind of decide what those trade offs are and what's acceptable and what isn't. And we also have to be able to measure those impacts in a, in a better way. And that's certainly something we're trying to do is that we're trying to actually make it you know, the measurement of all that material that's flowing into that system um, much better so that ultimately we can build better business models. We can look at reduction. We can look at reuse. We can look at recovery of materials, uh, but because we've got a better view on what is actually happening within that system. So a better real-time story. Yes, I like the way you framed that earlier on, a better version of the truth. Um, now, if I can come to Paul, can you tell us a little bit more about the innovative process your business uh, uses to drive efficiencies within the industry? And where did your idea come from? Um, how easy has that been to turn it into action? Um, well, actually, the idea came from um, the Edinburgh School. So I don't know if you know, people know that uh, a few years ago. You had uh, Ox Gang's schools, I think it was, in Edinburgh, and there was a wall collapsed, and uh, people didn't know. Um, it was a brand new school, the wall collapsed, and it, it kind of had a ghetto as well in it. And we, re we realized at that point um, that that wall shouldn't have collapsed, and there was ways that you can actually figure out how that wall collapsed and if it predict if it was going to collapse um, through tracking um, construction site activities. And we track construction site activities with mobile phones, basically. Um, so we deliberately took a sort of B2C uh, product that's widely used, kind of every all everyone all over the world pretty much, um, and we've used these sort of simple ways of tracking the information that comes onto a construction site tracking activities, um, and then we use that data, kind of to go on the AI sort of <laughs> theme again as we use AI and machine learning these types of technologies to understand what's actually going on there in detail, to understand to build profiles of what's going on, and then predict what might happen in the future. Um, so that's how we actually do um, pick up that type of information. The actual journey of getting here was um, hard to describe, actually. <laughs> good and bad, but mostly good, I would say. There's, all, there's always ups and downs, but it's pretty much always been um, up, I would say. Um, we've done, we've achieved a lot. We've really started three years ago and we've actually achieved quite a lot in that process. We've kind of we've built a small team. We've got international sales, we've got local sales. Um, we've got, uh, we work on HS2, we work with Morris Construction, we work with Scottish Water. So there's a lot of people that we're actually um, working with just now. And so we've actually progressed quite quickly in quite a, quite a short period of time. There is a lot of um, People do want this type, these types of technologies. People know that they're harming the environment. They don't want to harm the environment. Um, they want to. You, you need to give them the tools to be able to do that. And then when you give them the tools, then the behavioural change will come, and they will start to kind of reduce their impact on the environment uh, gradually. And what we're kind of hoping for is a bit like the British cycling team um, with Chris Hoy and the, kind of the management behind behind that is the, the philosophy being is that um, if you improve something by one percent, that will compound over time. And then what will happen is that by the time you get to the end of year one, for example, you will then have um, your 1% your saving will have been compounded over that year and you will have significant increases uh, or reduc reductions um, in your sort of carbon emissions or your waste and increases in your productivity. No, that's lovely. And I like the way you're saying about actually sometimes it comes down to, to presenting and giving tools to allow that practical action and that behavioural change will start to come, uh, will start to flow. And we've certainly noticed that here in Glasgow and what we've been doing with actually the circle economy as well in, uh, in the Netherlands. But I love the I love the visual of the Chris Hoy cycle team and uh, aiming for that 1%, but knowing that there's going to be an aggregated kind of uh, impact of that, that, that. That's lovely. Thank you for that. 
Now, Sam, um, when, when you finished speaking, I, I was sort of teeing you up for a question around bridging the gap between what businesses are doing and how businesses are thinking about climate and then telling that story right through to, to the fires. And obviously, you know, Sir David Attenborough is the, the epitome of, of, of being a figurehead in the space of the actual perfect planet side of it. But it's how do we, how do we get that gap between business over here doing its good stuff, the aggregate that's being talked about here or the aggregation that's talked about here by Paul and actually then how that translates to fires and climate issues generally as they manifest themselves. How, how do you think they're going to do that? I can only speak from, from our experience and, and we're now engaging some amazing pioneering businesses who, you know, we have a value at Water Bear, which is progress, not perfection. Um, so they are beginning their circularity journey or fairly advanced. And I think the number one thing I would say for bridging the gap is is the internal communications piece and the internal engagement piece. Um, because the employees of these amazing businesses are super engaged usually with these amazing stories and actually using film, storytelling, platforms, disruptive tech to actually engage those employee bases with some of these journey pieces is such a fantastic tool to really bridge that gap and drive real impact and action at the consumer level, but also at the kind of business level as well. We're engaging on a couple of great strategies that, you know, of course, use our core skill sets, use film, use storytelling, use the platform, use events, use amazing positionings like COP26 and others to really engage those uh, employee bases and that internal communications piece. I think other than that, the other thing that we've seen emerge in the business sector is really, as I've mentioned before, a, a, a almost a, a going back to nature piece where we should really be taking senior leadership and others into these amazing wild spaces and really reconnecting with, with the natural world. And I think the combination of that storytelling piece and that experiential piece will really start to bridge that gap between the actual root causes, the systemic issues that we that we see in the world, as well as what these businesses can do to actually impact their employee bases and their senior leadership. Um, and storytelling is the absolute core, in our opinion, of, of one of the best tools we've got to actually in, impact that positively and, and drive action and behaviour change, as you say. Super, thank you. Now, Michael, if I come to you, um, uh, if, if we were going to look at that through the world of topolitics, how would you see that we're going to bridge the gap between businesses, individual businesses, uh, using some of the technologies that you're working with to the actual end game? And how do, how do we translate it? Because it seems to be quite... Um, brutal, and it probably needs to be brutal in some respects to to show the actual impacts and damage that's happening. But actually, businesses are taking responsible action, and we're seeing that on a very much more regular basis now. But how do we, how do you take that story and bridge the gap through circular economy and what you're doing at Topolitics? Uh, yeah, you're right, Alison. It is pretty brutal out there. I mean, you know, if you look at the World Bank numbers in terms of that kind of material, it's going to go up from about two billion tons a year up to about three and a half billion tons a year in the next sort of 10, 20 years. So, so you've got a lot of material there. But I was going to pick up on Sam's point. I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, ultimately, we can, we can talk con conceptually about the circular economy. And I think the point was made earlier on about school kids, you know, kind of learning about it at school, but then they go out into, you know, into the sort of home environment or into the outside world. And they, 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 they don't see what's happening there. And and that's one of the reasons why we sort of specifically have chosen to sort of talk about waste because people kind of can relate to it and can kind of kind of understand it. And, and our, our approach, a big part of our approach is to visualize what is happening to that material. So, so a lot of the time, you know, if you're, if you're a company that's generating waste, you don't really know where that material is moved or what's being happened to it. So we, 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 that's where the mapping bit comes in because the map, is one of you know is a very very powerful storytelling device. Uh, so our platform is called Waste Map deliberately, deliberately because a big part of it is actually showing our customers what is happening to that material because you've got a physical material that's being moved around, whether it be on a local basis or a national basis, or is exported. And when people start to see what's happening to that material in that way, it actually does start to it helps them to kind of focus their minds on, well, actually, does it have to be that way? Could we sort of change the model? Could we actually sort of think about reducing that material in the first place? Could we think about recovering that material, keeping that in a sort of more of a sort of localized loop? 
So that's for us is one of the, the, the visual aspect of what we do is one of the sort of the big parts of, of driving that sort of action and driving that sort of behavior change that would come out of the, the insights that we are, are playing back to our customers. Thank you for that. Now, we've got a question for the audience, which is similar to the theme of the one in live streaming, but it's much more generic around just general uh, digitization, digitalization, because clearly it also has a, a kind of carbon footprint drama. Um, and actually be really interested to kind of get your thoughts on, on that, just whether it's emails right through to just day to day technology consumption. Um, what thoughts do you have as panelists? And have you got even any other use of devices that, that could be used to do it differently? Are you starting to see uh, emerging trends in that or are you starting to see different ways of people consuming digital tech in a better way? Who will I come to first? I'm going to come to Sam first. <laughs> um, I, we're, we're certainly, it's amazing. It's a bit of a simple answer, but I think the, the social media um, engagement that we're seeing around the world in terms of storytelling is, is incredible. You're having these content creators on platforms like TikTok now tell stories in 10 seconds. And, you know, the purists amongst us would, would really doubt that as a, as a medium for, for impact and action, but it is really working. And we're seeing this huge uh, digitization and impact that, that is happening at all forms of communication. I think the scary thing for us is, is the mental health piece. Um, there is the massive crisis that's involving now in younger people you know compounded by the pandemic and everything else and i think we really need to be very careful of this mass mass digitization as we move forward but it does seem to be a, a big big trend um we're also seeing you know the amazing ability for us to transmit our content in various different forms and we now not only have our own product but we have this whole ecosystem that we evolve in and actually transmit our stories through and it really has to be this complete 360, 360 approach um, in terms of storytelling now to get our, our messaging out there. So I agree. I think it's a little bit scary in terms of the mental health implications of this digital media addiction, but there is a huge upside to it, which is being able to get stories out there to new audiences across the world, not to mention the uh, far-flung places that maybe don't have the reach of something like a VOD platform where we can actually get stories through into um, communities that maybe would otherwise never ever see them. The educational aspect, of course, is huge too. And um, to come back to Paul, do you do you have any particular views on that in terms of digitalization and consumption in that space and how that can be done better? Uh, I know clean tech is generally referred to, and you might want to kind of comment on that as Mike Michael, I'll come to you next. Yeah, well, from our point of view, is so we we kind of take quite a lot of idea, ideas from the B2C world, uh, the digital B2C world. And what we are actually doing is we take that technology and then turn it into a ways of being productive. So we are, we're not actually encouraging people to be you know, like addicted to phones or anything or addictive to digital apps or anything like that. We're, we're giving you tools to help you be more productive during your day. And so basically, as we focus on B2B, we're not kind of too concerned about kind of at the end of the day people are finished and they will kind of leave all their sort of tech at the office <laughs> um so and because we're sort of very construction site focused as well um so that it literally is left at site so in, in that term in terms of like kind of the digitization part of it where it's actually a really good thing for the construction industry because the benefits will always outweigh um any sort of negative associations that, that will happen uh, particularly because construction needs to improve its productivity, it needs to reduce its emissions, and basically the, the the kind of reports for the construction industry as well is that the profit margins on average are at one point five percent, and they've got huge amounts of waste, huge amounts of uh, or very low productivity, particularly between uh, compared to other uh, industries. Um, it's estimated at one point six trillion dollars annually the construction industry loses in productivity compared to uh, the car industry. So you can see um, just by digitizing the construction industry, you will increase the productivity. Um, you'll actually end up reducing the emissions and reducing the waste at the same time. So the benefits for that are, are good. It means people get more done um, in a shorter period of time. So there is actually, kind of a look for the actual individual people as well, there's less stress because things are being automated um, that they wouldn't need to manually do uh, or they would need to do manually normally. Um, so there's actually a lot of benefits for digitization in the construction industry. Um, just because it's been one of the last sort of industries to, to digitize. 
Um, so yeah, yeah, we, I mean, we're seeing sort of a lot of benefits, and a lot of people are really uh, we, we're encouraged by the construction industry to kind of continue what we're doing. And uh, Michael, what about from your perspective? Obviously, you're coming at it from a different business perspective. So could you share with us any of your own views on digitalization and its impact in terms of carbon footprint? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think it's pick, pick up the point, points that have just been made. I mean, it's less about the way it's consumed, I think, so, certainly from our point of view. It's more about how um, sort of information and data is being captured in the first place, and and so there are a whole you know there's a whole range of different sort of technologies, whether it be you know taking a photograph with a you know with a mobile app or or, or a machine to machine system which is just sort of sensing something automatically. I think that's where the sort of the, the digitalization bit is really sort of making a difference, uh, certainly in our, in our, in our world. And it's even you know to the level of a uh, you know you have these kind of whole communities of you know what are known as waste pickers, you know sort of people. Uh, who are working and, and collecting uh, waste in, in, you know, in sort of, you know, different countries, and it's a very sort of informal system of of, of waste collection or materials collection. But they're now starting to use kind of really simple but effective and very powerful kind of app-based systems for sort of capturing information about the the amount of sort of plastic bottles they've collected, for example, so that they can actually they have a digital record. So that they can actually secure a, a, a proper, you know, proper payment uh, for that for those materials that they've collected. So, so, so a lot of it again comes back to the idea of technology that is um, accessible and and co cost effective in order to sort of do the job, the, uh, an effective job of in that instance capturing that data, but then making sure that those people actually have a um, you know a a, a a decent sort of um, kind of revenue from what they're from what they're doing. So I'd certainly see it at the data capture end, and then obviously in terms of how we're consuming it, then clearly that you know back to Sam's point. I mean you know clearly you've got social media, mobile devices, etc., etc., etc. So so I think it's more on the data capture side certainly from from what we see. That's super. I think, again, we could probably have a whole session just on uh, tech and digital disruption because uh, it is going to be uh, one of the biggest pioneering areas of change. I think looking ahead, I'd be really interested to hear from each of you um, any specific examples that you have seen from business, out with your own, obviously, because you're all going to think your own businesses are marvellous, I hope, anyway, um, where you've actually seen some really good practice and that you think are particularly innovative circular economy businesses in action that you can share with our audience here this morning. Paul, I'll come to you first. Hmm. I may need a bit of time to think about that one. <laughs> okay, I'll come back to you, Sam. <laughs> uh, I'll go with a relevant example here from the Netherlands, a fantastic uh, sustainable and on a quest to become the first 100% circular um, denim company, Mud Jeans. They've really been amazing to work with and we're working with them very closely. And there's a new series coming up that we're going to be collaborating on, which is really exciting. So watch this space, but big shout out to Mud. Um, they've been, uh, yeah, inspirations for us and obviously very linked to our partners at the Circle Economy and mutual friends of everyone probably on this panel. So yeah, big shout out to Mud. They are, they are doing some amazing things. They are indeed, and I'm delighted to see that we actually had them speaking at one of our Get Inspired events a couple of years ago in West Brewery, and they are indeed a fantastic business proposition. So thank you for that. Uh, Michael? Uh, well, I always start with uh, Patagonia because, uh, you know, um, you know they've, been, they've been at it for, for a long time now. Um, and, uh, and, of course, that really came through, you know, the founder's own own vision. You've also got um, Interface, the flooring business, you know, Ray Anderson, I mean, that's an amazing story of how he realized that, you know, they were making a product that was hydrocarbon based and they completely switched that around to, to something which has a sort of net sort of positive benefit. And that's a, that's a really interesting story as well. But then of course, you've got other examples closer to home. Uh, I think Quantec, which are, you know, using sort of waste from the sort of shellfish industry, You've got, um, I, and I apologise, but I forget the name, uh, uh, another company that's co just come out of Harriet Watt University that's kind of making uh, construction blocks from, um, from waste as well. Um, yeah, Kinetech. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so you've got some great sort of, you know, kind of global sort of longstanding kind of examples, but you've got some really, really good examples on a sort of more localised uh, basis as well. So. 
That's great. And uh, m um, most of these brands are ones that, again, we're, we've been delighted to be able to work with. Uh, Patagonia, we had alongside Accenture and Dale at our 7083 Presidents Network uh, just last year, actually. And we've worked with Quantec and they're coming up on, on the panel soon, shortly. And Kinotech, we've worked with in various events as well. So some of these businesses are indeed truly inspiring and, and great to hear. Paul, have you have you had a time yeah. to reflect? Yeah, yeah, I did. I just had a bit of brain freeze there. And then there was it's a great company in Taiwan that I quite like. Um, and it was it's, it's quite old now. I think it's about 15, maybe 16 years old. And it was one of the first places that I've seen where they just took, um, it's called Mini, Mini Wiz. And basically, they, they, they took plastic bottles and just built a, a building with it, basically. Um, they, they recycled the bottles in many different ways. So that basically, it was part of the cladding. It was part of the windows. And this was all from recycled bottles. And some of it was basically almost like a direct use of that material. So there was very little process in between. Um, and it was just the whole concept of that, that building um, being made from basically plastic bottles uh, was one of the things that sort of I thought was really impressive is this is how we should use waste. Great. No, these are all fantastic examples and one which I'm sure everybody will uh, be happy to look up more on and some of which are actually case studies uh, on the Circular Glasgow website if you want to go and look for more on there too. Now, it would be rude of me not to kind of conclude without mentioning uh, COP, which is coming later on this year. And uh, I just wondered if very briefly, if each of you would like to share as much as you can, of course, uh, what you see coming up in your own world for COP and any specific things that you think you would like to see happen as a result of COP's engagement in Glasgow this year? Sam, I'll come to you first. Thank you, Alison. Uh, yes, I'm trying to work out what I can and can't say. Um, we have uh, three film premieres coming up at COP with uh, a major media partner, which is very exciting, including one um, with our great friends and partners at Off The Fence um, and also the Circle Economy. Um, I'll say no more than that, but do watch this space because I think the audience would be very interested in, in the film. Um, we're also working uh, on a big activation around, uh, we're co-hosts of the Environmental Photographer of the Year this year. And we're very excited that um, we'll be bringing, I think I can say this, I'm going to get in so much trouble. Uh, we've, we'll be bringing the Environmental Photographer of the Year exhibition to COP. Um, that is all I can say, but do look out for it if you're coming. Um, very excited to see how we can use our storytelling, how we can use, in particular, one of these films to bring the youth grassroots voice to the climate conference um, and really try and uh, mobilize some action around that. Um, we really want to move away from this top down approach, I think, and, and really drive. Um, innovation um, and excitement within that youth delegation. And I think we're, we'll be bringing the perfect film to do that. So do watch this space. Great. That's exciting. Paul, I'll come to you next. So, uh, well, so we're a Glasgow based company and we're, we're working with the Scottish Enterprise and uh, Glasgow City Council as well. So we're hoping to look at, make a big splash at COP26. And um, we're also part of Climate Trace, and we're so I don't want to say too much on Climate Trace at the moment. Um, but was, there should be some good news around uh, COP26 and Climate Trace um, at, at those at that time, and so it's a good place. pay attention at that at that time, basically, <laughs> and watch that space. But uh, I better not say too much on the or else the PR people will be, get me, <laughs> basically. No, this is all, all good stuff. And of course, um, we would be happy to, to, to work the stories to best interest through our own channels as well, because it's all part of the, the, the bigger picture. So that's great. And then um, last but by no means least, Michael, I'm going to come to you to just comment a little bit about anything that you can say about your own business in the run up to COP and also the Circular Cities Innovation Challenge. You might want to say a little bit about that. Oh, well, th th thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> listen, uh, yeah, so um, so the Circular Cities Innovation Challenge was uh, a competition that was organised by uh, Glasgow, uh, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, uh, Toronto, New York, uh, to find uh, tech that could uh, enable uh, or help to enable circular economy in those in those cities. And so um, they had 126 companies, I think, applied, uh, and we were one of five winners of that. So basically, you know, we'll be working with. Uh, one or some of those uh, those cities uh, around some of this um, some of their sort of circular economy ambitions. Um, so that that's just been announced. So that's so that's a really exciting uh, kind of um, sort of opportunity for us. Um, other things that we work with, um, we run a global circular economy competition organised by SAP, the the enterprise software company, and uh, and Google and. 
Um, and so we've been working with SAP and some of their customers who are some of the world's biggest consumer product companies. And uh, so we did a, a project looking at uh, material flows um, from their operations in Scotland um, last year. So we'll be hopefully showcasing that uh, at, at COP this year. Um, and, and, and I think generally speaking around COP, I, I really hope that there is um, a focus on materials and, and, and the idea of resource efficiency in relation to, 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 to carbon and climate. Because clearly there's going to be a big focus on energy per se, um, but but really within that, you know, the the energy that's expended on the production, the consumption, and the use of goods and materials, of course, is quite significant. So I think we can't divorce the materials and circular economy picture from that broader sort of climate picture. So I really hope that that is recognised across, you know, the various kind of activities that are going to be going to be run during the during the conference. No, and I couldn't agree any more with that last point that you're making as well. So so thank you for reinforcing that. It is absolutely about the bigger picture and net zero as targets are really, really helpful to focus everybody's minds. But unless we do transition to this circular economy approach, uh, which is better for all, um, and including business, and it's good for business because it's good for business to, to, to make money in a better way as well. Um, I think these things are really important to, to re-emphasise. Now, we have covered a lot of ground, so I'm not going to do a kind of uh, a, an in-depth summary. Uh, I would just say that there are a couple of points that I would put back into the room again based on what you have all said here today. Um, one is actually very much in alignment with something that we say as well, which is that the pursuit of semicircular is fabulous. Don't lose sight of uh, progress uh, in the pursuit of perfection. And I think that was actually pretty much what Sam was saying as part of the value set um, from Waterbear, progress, not perfection. Um, I, I think some of what Michael was saying around uh, a better version of the truth and having a tech enabling that better version of the truth so that better commercial and social decisions can be taken by business. I think that's an absolutely brilliant point. Um, we also heard a little bit from Michael about uh, you know low cost disruptive tech and the ability to scale change as a result of that, because obviously when things are being tested and proof of concept, that quite often has a high cost. So. I think that's a really useful point as well. And then Paul was making some really brilliant points around, you know, B2C, tracking information and actually using data to understand and to predict what's going to happen and what might happen in the future. And actually starting with some tools and those tools can help to inspire, inform and motivate that behavioural change. Um, and then lastly, the point by Michael about that important emphasis on consumption of materials in parallel to the pursuit of renewable energy. So I think all of these things are really super points for us to conclude today's second panel session on. And that leaves me the very final job now of saying a very, very, very large thank you to Sam, to Michael and to Paul for joining us here this morning. Mm -hmm.